Thanks. So when it comes to building things on the web, there's no shortage of choice. There are dozens of frameworks, hundreds of libraries and utilities, and scads of solutions to the same problem. Um, web applications today are fairly complex, and there's a lot of moving parts that need to work together. And making a decision in one portion of your code can have rippling effects throughout the rest of your code. So how do you know, um, when it comes to choosing modules, which modules to choose and when it's a good idea to build your own solution? So uh, in order to do this, we'll, we'll look at one of the first places where jQuery had to make a decision about external tools, and that was the build system. So uh, jQuery first supported Make, and Make was chosen because it was the build system that John favored. Uh, and it makes sense for a decision like that to be made based on internal project use. But uh, pretty quickly after make support was added, ant support was added. And that was presumably done so that people working on Windows that didn't have make installed but did have ant installed could easily build jQuery without installing make. Um, and then uh, a few years later, there was rake support added. And when John added rake support, there was immediately a comment saying, great, I was wondering why it wasn't there before. Uh, so we can assume that a, this comment is from someone entrenched in the Ruby world, right? He probably uses Rake on all of his projects, but it's also pretty likely that he has Make or Ant already installed, and so building jQuery isn't actually difficult for him. But this is a fairly typical um, reaction from web developers, right? Like, I use X, therefore you should support it. And it seems like an innocent request, but it actually creates a huge burden on library maintainers. So for over a year, jQuery supported three simultaneous build systems. There was Make, Ant, and Rake all living side by side. Um, but they were actually like rarely in sync because it's a lot of work to do that. So uh, when Colin Snover finally removed the Rake and Ant builds, he said, having three different build systems was too much to maintain and Make was the only one consistently kept up to date. So the cost of having three build systems actually isn't three times as much work as having one build system. It's a lot more than that because the teams have to be aware of like all the different intricacies of how to work with that build tool and deal with any gotchas or bugs in those individual build tools. And any time something like that crops up, you have to handle them separately for each build. Uh, so it's hard to say how jQuery would be affected if it never supported Ant or Rake. Um, but you can say for certain that what we do today is much saner. So today, what we do is we just support making, uh, generating builds of jQuery through Grunt. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure how, uh, how difficult it is to set up the build system on Windows today compared to 2006 when we only Make was supported for a few days. Uh, but it, like it, it, there just can't be that big of a, a difference that we needed to support three build systems uh, for the period that we did. Um, but let's take a look at something else that happened more recently. Uh, and this is outside of the jQuery world. Yahoo has recently announced the end of YUI. Uh, and they say that, uh, so JavaScript is now more ubiquitous than ever. The emergence of Node.js has allowed JavaScript to be used on the server side, opening up the door to creating isomorphic single page applications. New package managers such as NPM and Bower have spurred the rise of an ecosystem of third party, open source, single purpose tools that complement each other, embracing the Unix philosophy and enabling very complex development use cases. New build tools such as Grunt, Broccoli, and Gulp have made it easier to assemble those tiny modules into large cohesive applications. New application frameworks such as Backbone, React, Ember, Polymer, Angular, etc., have helped architect web applications in a more scalable and maintainable way. New testing tools such as Mocha, Casper, Karma, etc., have lowered the barrier of entry to building a solid continuous delivery pipeline. Standards bodies such as W3C and ECMA are standardizing what the large JavaScript frameworks have brought to the table over the years, making them available natively to a larger number of devices. Finally, browser vendors are now committed to making continuous improvements to their web browsers while aligning more closely with standards. With so-called evergreen web browsers, which are making it easier for users to run the latest stable version of a web browser, we can expect a significant reduction in the amount of variance across user agents. 
The consequence of this evolution in web technologies is that large JavaScript libraries such as YUI have been receiving less attention from the community. Many developers today look at large JavaScript libraries as walled gardens they don't want to be locked into. As a result, the number of YUI issues and pull requests we've received in the past couple of years has slowly reduced to a trickle. Most core YUI modules do not have active maintainers, relying instead on a slow stream of occasional patches from external contributors. Few reviewers still have time to ensure that the patches submitted are reviewed quickly and thoroughly. Therefore, we have made the difficult decision to immediately stop all new development on YUI. Now, I think some of this wording is just Yahoo trying to save face. Um, clearly, they're aware of what's going on. They referenced like, over a dozen libraries and frameworks here. Um, so I'm not sure how they're going to draw the conclusion that developers are afraid of being locked into JavaScript libraries. Uh, I think what really happened is YUI just was never really that popular, and over the year it has become less and less popular. Uh, so if we look at built with, we can see that over the past few years, YUI usage has like just been plummeting. But even back two years, it was only used on 40 out of the top million sites. Um, and so if you con contrast that with like jQuery UI usage statistics, which are consistently rising, and jQuery mobile usage statistics, which are consistently rising, and Dojo's usage statistics, which are consistently rising, and Angular's usage statistics, which are consistently rising. Right? And you can see this pattern over and over and over across tons of libraries. Uh, so it's kind of hard for Yahoo to make this claim that developers are afraid of being locked into these libraries. Uh, but getting back to the issue at hand, Yahoo has announced the end of YUI. Um, and so they're basically saying that they're, this is such an overcrowded space that they're just going to withdraw from the competition. And this is a good thing, right? They, they've recognized that there's enough competition in this area that they should go focus somewhere else and solve other problems. Um, and so that's a good thing. And if we scroll down to the, the notes section, we can see that someone named Didic has written, um, this is good news. This means there will be new and better tools under development. I hope they consider SAS to be part of it. Uh, so <laughs> I think it's funny that like, his reaction to YUI being over is hopefully the next tool uses SAS. Um, but somebody named Ian says, SAS is just as old and heavy with a huge Ruby dependency. Didic says, I've never had any performance issues with SAS. I wonder how big your SAS files are. Ian says, compile times are really bad since you have to wait for Ruby's slow watcher and the whole process has no caching. Try stylus with gulp as your build tool and you'll see just how nice 10 milliseconds of build times are with a SAS-like language without the overhead. So we're back to build systems. Um, so maybe we should be using gulp instead of grunt and apparently we should be using stylus for our CSS. So Learn Boost describes Stylus as an expressive, robust, feature-rich CSS language for building, built, built for Node.js. Right? So that sounds pretty good. Uh, we prefer Node over Ruby for our dependencies, and hopefully that would keep the rake file request at bay. Um, <laughs> so we can look at who is building this. We can see that it was started by TJ, so it must be good, right? Um, but it looks like he stopped working on this two years ago, and that's because he's been working on this other project called Rework. And uh, Rework is defined as a plugin framework for CSS preprocessing in Node.js. So how is that different from Stylus? Uh, well, we're not the only people wondering this. So Jason says, everything that Stylus can do, Rework can be extended to do. Is there any exclusive benefit to Stylus? I can't think of one other than more features right now. What's your personal take on Stylus? Is it deprecated? I guess you could release a new version of Stylus that's basically just a module or opinionated bundle of rework plugins, a la Janus for Vim. TJ's response is, rework is just much easier to maintain and faster by design. It doesn't have an entire interpreter built in. The more we wrote stuff, the less we used most of the interpreter. I'm not entirely convinced those are even good features because they really promote coupling. So I wrote rework to speed up our builds and only use what we actually need, which is mostly just some nesting and CSS3 stuff. Okay, so now we know rework is faster by design. So that gets us back to where we started from when Ian said, try stylus with gulp as your build tool and you'll see how nice 10 millisecond build times are. So maybe Ian should be trying rework to see how nice even faster builds are. So at this point we have grunt, gulp, sass, stylus, and rework. So how do we know which one to use? So of course the, the most obvious thing to do is just do a Google search and get the opinion of other random developers. So 
So we search for grunt gulp in CSS because we don't know which CSS preprocessor to, to use. Uh, we click on the first link and we see that it's from Adi Asmani, so this is probably going to be useful, except that it's about spring cleaning unused CSS with grunt, gulp, broccoli, or brunch. So <laughs> we don't have an answer to our question about what free processor to use, but at least now we have more options for our build tools. <laughs> so, so at this point we have a few options. We could read through tons of articles on grunt versus gulp versus broccoli versus brunch versus half a dozen other build tools and task runners. And we could also read dozens of articles about SAS and less and rework and stylus and whatever else might exist. Um, or we could compare the APIs on paper and just see which one looks like it's best and matches our, our requirements. Um, or we could build sample apps with all the different technologies we can find and see which one we think feels the best. Or we could just say, screw it, I'm going to start my actual project, get real work done, and use what I already know, and then potentially come back to this later on. So how many people think that the best use of your time at this point would be to read articles? Nobody. OK, so that means that nobody should write blog posts about technology anymore. Um, how many people think that comparing APIs on paper is the best use of your time? One person. Awesome. And what about building small sample apps? OK, more people. And how many people think you should just start getting real work done and ignore this problem? <laughs> well, look at that. We have a room full of pragmatists. Um, but the cool thing about this question is there's no right or wrong answer. And the terrible thing about this question is that there's no right or wrong answer. So we get all of these things happening. Um, so there are developers that feel like building s sample apps is actually like the best thing you can do. So they just sit down and write the same app over and over and over and over and over. And then they publish it. And so you get things like to do MVC. Uh, so to do MVC says developers these days are spoiled with choice when it comes to selecting an MV star framework for structuring and organizing their JavaScript web apps. Backbone, Ember, AngularJS, the list of new and stable solutions continues to grow. But just how do you decide on which to use in a sea of so many options? To help solve this problem, we created To Do MVC, a project which offers the same to do application implemented using MV star concepts in most of the popular JavaScript MV star frameworks of today. And we can see over here they have three dozen different uh, MV star frameworks. And then below that, they have a list of related libraries. Um, so, how many people have actually used To Do MVC? Oh wow, a bunch of you. But you, that was more people than the number of people that said building sample apps would be useful. Uh, so of the people who have used to do MVC, how many people have made a decision and then wondered whether they made the right decision after they had made their decision? That was probably at least half of the people that made that that have used to do MVC. And then of those people, how many people actually decided to change their decision after they'd started their project? Oh, one person. Everyone else was just afraid. Uh, so Barry Schwartz has popularized the paradox of choice. He says, the more options there are, the easier it is to regret anything at all that is disappointing about the option that you chose. So we're all familiar with the saying, the grass is always greener on the other side. Um, the paradox of choice says that because you have a choice to make, you're more likely to regret whatever decision you do make just because of the fact that you had a choice. Uh, so you're, you're more likely to be wondering whether you chose correctly, and that will lead to regret. Uh, so what, what Schwartz says is the, this imagined alternative induces you to regret the decision you made, and this regret subtracts from the satisfaction that you get out of the decision you made even if you made a good decision. Uh, so with this in mind, I've written a new introduction for To Do MVC. And it says, developers these days are plagued with choice when it comes to selecting anything for the JavaScript web applications. Backbone, Ember, AngularJS, the list of new and stable solutions continues to grow. But just how do you decide which to use in the sea of so many options? To make the insanity of this problem explode exponentially, we created To Do MVC. A project which offers the same to-do application, implementing MV star concepts in more frameworks than you knew existed. Now, instead of choosing between Backbone, Ember, and Angular, you can be overwhelmed with dozens of implementations that don't actually tell you the pros and cons of each choice. Um, but maybe some of you prefer 
comparing APIs on paper. Um, so you might like Garen Means' template engine chooser, where you can just come and answer some simple questions, and it'll narrow it down, and by the end, you should have an answer, or no answers, <laughs> or many answers. Um, so it might help you, it might not, but again, at least now you have more options than you knew existed before. Um, so maybe you're looking for UI libraries built on top of jQuery. You could look at Cody Lindley's list of frameworks. Um, Cody also has a, an opinionated list of landscaping tools. Uh, so it says right here, opinionated, except that this has like, I don't know how there are this many libraries. Um, but the cool thing about this page is it links to more comparison pages, like Will Moore's front-end package manager comparison, where he says, it's about time for front-end developers to have a decent package manager. Front-end development is serious business, and there's no good reason for us to continue with subpar tools or no tools at all. And I agree with Will about this. It is time for us to have a decent package manager. Um, but we can see that he actually shows us six different package managers. So we have Bower, Component, Jam, Volo, NPM with Browserify, and SPM. And we can look at all this data that he's collected. Or we could just scroll down to the very bottom and read his final thoughts, where he says that each package manager is built by talented, responsive, and friendly developers. Ultimately, to evaluate for your team, you have to put a weight on each category and score per your needs. So surely there can't be that many varying needs across teams that we need six different package managers working in isolation. Um, but maybe we want to look at the CSS front end frameworks comparison, which even has a column for less than SaaS support, which I guess means the world isn't ready for rework or stylus. <laughs> Um, and then there's also the JavaScript loader comparison, which is a, a Google spreadsheet, because surely there should be two dozen different solutions to this problem. Uh, but perhaps the best is the style guide guide, <laughs> because, <laughs> because with the style guide guide, <laughs> when you finally made a decision about all the other tools you want to use and how you're going to use them, you can use this guide to determine which tool you're going to use to write the guide about how to use the other tools that you've chosen. <laughs> so, and then for all the Wikipedia lovers, there is a comparison of JavaScript frameworks on Wikipedia as well. Um, so I think we can all agree this is getting a bit out of hand. Uh, so if anyone's thinking about building a new library in an overcrowded space, please take some time to think about whether you're really building another implementation that would be beneficial to the community. Uh, start by talking to the maintainers of other libraries and see if you can collaborate. Um, the collaboration may even just be on a shared dependency, but every bit of collaboration helps. It goes a long way. Uh, so there are legitimate reasons to create a library that competes with other libraries, though. And this is usually due to competing goals or de design philosophies. So. If one developer has a primary goal that has technical ramifications which don't mesh well with another developer's primary goal, then those two developers obviously won't be able to collaborate on a shared project. Um, they may be able to find some common ground and create a, a shared dependency, but ultimately they'll end up with two separate libraries for the same task. And that's fine as long as they, ha they actually are serving different needs within that same solution. Um, but Given, even given that, I highly doubt that there are enough competing design philosophies to warrant there being 17 different template engines or two dozen different JavaScript loaders. Uh, so this doesn't mean that you should go out and try to build a library that like, is an all-encompassing tool that deals with the things that all the other existing libraries do. Um, instead, we just, as tough as it is, library maintainers just need to be able to actually evaluate their library and determine you know, what the right thing to do is. Um, you know, it may, be it may be the right thing to do is to just bow out and let, an let another library, you know, win in the space, right? And we can see that Yahoo has finally done this with YUI. Um, so it's good that they're doing this, even though it took them a while to do it. Uh, so where do we go from here? If you're a library maintainer, you should start by seriously considering whether your project is solving an otherwise unsolved problem. If it is, great. Make it explicitly clear in your README 
why your library is different or better than other libraries. Right? It should be ex extremely clear for potential users to determine whether they should be using your library versus some other library. Um, you might even want to take the time to work with the maintainers of other libraries and create more comparison pages, but make pages that are actually useful for people. Right? Like have, have an actual description of the different design philosophies or, or the pros and cons of each module. Um, so, so you know, say something like, Foo is designed for speed, but it does so at the cost of you know, highly limited extensibility. If you're looking for more customizable implementations, use the bar module. Uh, you should actually be able to guide users to using the right module. Don't, don't give me stupid comparisons about like file size or which module loaders you support or which package manager you publish on or how many stores you have on GitHub. Tell me the actual technical merit of why I should use your library. Um, but on the other hand, if you're maintaining a library that's really just adding to the sea of choice, then um, just do the right thing talk to the other library maintainers, figure out which library should live on, deprecate everything else, and just move towards a saner future. If you're a potential user of a library and you can't figure out which library to use, then put the burden on the library maintainers. File issues for them to update their readmes or maybe create comparison pages that actually tell you why you should use their library. And if you're using a library and you know why it's better than another uh, tool, then you should file a pull request to update the README explaining why. Um, there's no reason that the excitement of building a new web app today should be muddled by the overwhelming confusion of which tools to use. So that's my speech. Go out and get rid of all the duplication. Any questions? So, uh, so, so let me repeat that just so it gets onto the recording. Any any suggestions on on how to incentivize people to kill their own projects off? Um. So I, I think it, it's all in the framing. So you don't want to talk to somebody about, you know, you're, you're just a waste of space. You should go away. Um, what, what you want to say is, you know, it's, it's great that you've built this tool, but, um, you know, why, why didn't you ask them to basically ask them to defend what they've done, right? Ask them, why did you decide to create an, another implementation? And if they have a good reason, then maybe it does deserve to exist. But if they don't, then maybe you know, try and explain to them there's, there's such an overwhelming amount of choice, people are having a hard time figuring out whether they should use yours. And so maybe you should just work with, you know, get one solution that's the best. Um, I don't really have any magic words that you can say to somebody that will make them give up on a project. People tend to have like ego attached to code. Um, it's, it's pretty hard to remove yourself emotionally from your code, but it's also really important to do if you want to be a professional programmer. So just try and convince them that they're doing the, the to make whatever decision is best for the community, and hopefully that will encourage them. Okay, my question is uh, pretty simple. What tools do you recommend? <laughs> what do you use? Well, I, I, uh, <laughs> I hate tools um, because I hate making decisions. And I tend to work on tools where my decisions have rippling effects to other users, not just to my code. So um, you. You can look back and just see me like arguing hard against everything all the time. Uh, like when people ask for less support in jQuery UI and I say, well, what about the SAS users? And then when somebody says, well, let's put SAS in UI, I say, well, what about the less users? What about the rework users? What about the stylist users? Right? It, it's just not sane to support all of them. So I, always, I tend to go down the path of 
just don't use anything. Um, most of these tools, like a lot of them don't actually increase your pro productivity immensely if you're working on a single project um, because you have to take all the time to like ramp up and learn. Um, so I don't know, the, what tools I use depend on what project I'm on and what, what I actually need. In, in terms of build tools, I've used Grunt a lot because that's what we've standardized on for jQuery projects. Um, but I, you know, it just depends on the project. I usually start with no tools and only add tools as I need them. All right, time for one last question. How do you balance this perspective um, with the notion that uh, multiple people solving the same problem actually helps push things forward? Um, so it's okay to try out ideas, right? And, and multiple people working on the same problem space pushes that problem space forward. Uh, that's generally true when the people are not going with the exact same design philosophies into their solutions, right? And that's the case where it's okay to compete. As long as there is some relatively important reason for there to be a difference between another implementation, that's when you're gonna get real competition, right? So, you know, you have one focus, another person has another focus, that's where you get the competition, and that's where it's actually okay to compete. But, um, if you do compete and it turns out that th that one idea actually is better than the other, at some point, like it is useful to acknowledge that, but it can be difficult if you've built up like a large user base to just say, you know what, after three years we've realized this is not the best solution and we're just going to stop. Like that, it is a hard thing to do when you've amassed a user base. All right. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Oh, one last question. Were any cats harmed in the making of that presentation? None. All right. Well, in that case, let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs>